and welcome to Words on New Music in Reviews. I'm Jim Gooden here in Brooklyn, New York, and Paul Muller is out in Los Angeles, California. We are going to feature three artists from a recent Improv Friday uh, weekend event. Uh, they are Chris Vaisville, Jeff Duke, and Steve Moy. Uh, we'll listen to each of them and discuss them a bit. So I'm going to toss the hat out to Paul in California and kick it off talking about Chris. Well, our first uh, piece today is by Chris Vaisville. Uh, Chris is from Indianapolis, Indiana, and he's been a longtime participant uh, at Improv Friday. He's a guitar player, but his musical interests run towards microtonal tuning and experimental works. He uh, has on his webpage, uh, I am a uh, 12 equal tone, equal temperament uh, microtonal composer who works at the edge between acoustic and electronic instruments. And I think his emphasis lately has been on microtonal and alternate tunings. Uh, Chris is interested in science. He's often posted on Facebook uh, something about the space program or the Mars landing uh, recently. He's also been trained as a chemist, uh, so he has a good, strong uh, science and math background. And uh, that's got to be part of his uh, attraction to the uh, microtuning uh, world. Uh, on... Uh, his website, he lists some of the uh, credits that he's uh, uh, gathered. Uh, he says, I've been performed several times in Urbana, Illinois, at the Independent Media Center, hmm. uh, and also in association with Odd Music Urbana. And he, he's had performances at the Zen Harmonic Praxis uh, 2011 that was held in uh, at the Gesundheit Institute in West Virginia. Uh, his music has also received radio play. Uh, his pieces have been performed also in Chicago, New York, Boston, and other cities. And uh, one of his compositions, uh, Edia Karin Garden, uh, was for classical guitar and has been selected and performed in New York as part of the Vox Novus Composer's Voice series. Uh, he has a website, www.chrisvaisville.com. That's C-H-R-I-S-V-A-I-S-V-I-L. And the piece we're going to hear today is a little bit um, off uh, the norm for what we uh, get from uh, Chris. Uh, it's a piece called uh, Marion County Jail. Uh, it was, uh, according to uh, the thread uh, that he posted this on, a little note said it was inspired by a phone message that he received. <laughs> so uh, let's listen to this and, uh, and see what we can make of it. It's something I think a little unusual from Chris. <laughs> Thank you. 
Wow. That was intense. That's, uh, you know, the graphic on that, um, Paul, that he, you referenced to that he had on the thread. And the thread, for listeners who don't know, is uh, it's an Improv Friday tr electronic trail that uh, is an invitation um, two and a half days every week, beginning Thursday afternoon, um, about 4 p.m. Pacific time, and ending Saturday evening, 6 p.m. Pacific time and invites member artists and anybody is interested in new music as a composer or an improviser to join Improv Friday and contribute work. Um, and so we have an online sort of message board going, if you will, and we tag essentially a piece on that stored from another site and reference the link and then it winds up getting posted on the, uh, on the event on the main Improv Friday page, which is improvfriday.com. Uh, in short, so Chris has this picture of a jail cell from the inside, and you know it's giving you this vibe that there you are. And uh, we don't really know how this message came to be that inspired this piece, but it's really uh, we're talking about it earlier, and it's really scary. It's got some really uh, between that robotic kind of mechanized voices going on, and just probably some fancy tunings in there as well. But uh, it was a scary piece. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I, I, it was very ominous, very chilling. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, very effective use of that canned voice that comes on as a recording. You know, that's a, a real effective way to, uh, to get kind of a disconnect between what's happening around us, the uh, things we hear on the news or, or get over the telephone, and, uh, and the music. You know, it really, uh, really is very dramatic. Uh, I thought it recreated exactly the kind of phone call you never want to get. Uh, <laughs> you're, hearing, you're hearing it, but you can't believe it's happening, and you just feel numb. And I think Chris has uh, is, you know, brought that feeling out uh, exactly. Uh, you mentioned the graphic. It, it was uh, you know, really added to uh, you know, the, the mood and tone of the piece. Um, there's kind of an impersonal yet malevolent feel to this whole thing. You know, you're, it's like you're standing in front of some big machine that, well, it can do you harm, but it's, you know, you're not sure what to do or what it's going to do. It's, uh, you know, it's kind of frightening. And, uh, you know, around halfway in at about, uh, two minutes, there was a, a nice manipulation of the voice frequencies from the recording. I thought that was very well done. And, uh, you know, I don't know if there was any alternate tuning in there. I, I, don't, I don't doubt there was. Uh, but, you know, the mood and tone and feel of this, I think, owes a little more to Steve Mosier than to Chris. You know, Chris is usually oh, yeah. experimenting yeah. with his new uh, tonalities and, and uh, alternate tuning, and he gives us something kind of, you know, upbeat and uh, alive. Uh, this, is, uh, this is just downright scary, especially <laughs> when you have that graphic in front of you. So it was uh, something a little different, and I thought, well done. Oh, for sure. I, 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 would, I would echo that. And, and that's a really good reference uh, to Steve Mosher because when we, we featured him before and we talk about that thing where his, his online work is often just completely different identity from what, uh, Paul, you've heard him. He's a L.A.-based composer and educator. Uh, you've heard him perform in a very rhythmic ensembles, and yet uh, some of his stuff that we have online is like right out of, Right out of Tim Burton Ghostbusters in a lot of the places. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Probably more yeah. scarier than that. Well, just like For what sure. we've heard. And, uh, you know, yeah, you never know uh, how influences move. You know, uh, maybe Chris heard something like that and, and tried to capture those moods for this uh, piece. Uh, you know, and I, as I say, I think he's done a good job to do that. I agree. Uh, something weird, something wigged him out about that phone call. <laughs> so I, I yeah. think there you go. Inspiration in the moment. Listen, the next guy we're going to feature is somebody we're both kind of excited about because it's 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 uh, a fellow I've known for several years. Uh, uh, a guitarist, musician, looping artist uh, who lives down in Ocala, Ocala. I often say that wrong, Florida, um, and. Uh, his name is Jeff Duke, and I met him several years ago through the Looper's Delight mailing list. Uh, looping is a, uh, an art of performing with a being able to record bits and pieces of something and layer new parts over it and manipulate it and do a range of things. And the mailing list is uh, an, a, 
about a 13 year old uh, online experience that has a lot of uh, just a huge member base from all over the planet and I joined it around 2006 when I started playing with the technology and I was researching uh, a looping pedal and I happened to see uh, as people often do I mean you know they tend to post their gear and stuff short Jeff's name came up and we began to have some discussions and I uh, found out we had some commonality in various things and uh, we went on to do a NinJam session together which is a, a way for one or more or two or more uh, folks to connect musically and have real-time interaction and we grew that uh, continuing interest and wound up uh, putting together over time a quintet uh, featuring uh, artists from the states as well as abroad in fact uh, Steve Moyes who we're going to talk about in a little bit uh, is part of that experience is called Dig It Signal and Peter Thorne in Sweden, I should mention everybody. So there's the four of us, and the fifth person is Ray Storko, a drummer friend down in, uh, down also in Florida. Uh, but uh, to move along, uh, Jeff and I uh, got acquainted uh, electronically, and then we both went to the Y2K International Live Looping Festival, which is held every October in Santa Cruz, California. And uh, we met in person. And in addition to our meeting, uh, another gentleman he had collaborated with from Italy uh, and they had defined an, as an ensemble called U uh, Use It, it's U-S-I-T uh, and his name is Gatano Fontanaza and Gatano came over and uh, so it was a, like a big homecoming week and it was just really cool to hang out and experience some of Jeff's music live and Paul you've got a, a few other anecdotes to tell about Jeff before we hear a piece of his and I'm going to switch over the camera to you sir Sure. Uh, well, <laughs> I've you know met Jeff on Improv Friday, but of course we uh, kept uh, correspondence on Facebook, and uh, among other things, we share a couple of common interests outside of music. Uh, he has an old Jeep, and I have an old Toyota pickup truck, so we're always swapping stories about car repair and uh, who was in the worst trouble in the worst place uh, with a broken down uh, vehicle. Uh, and we we have uh, tips and and tricks that we. Uh, exchange about replacing water pumps or uh, hoses and one thing or another. Uh, so Jim and I have uh, gotten acquainted through car repair. Plus he has uh, a black, oh Jeff, yeah. Uh, and he has this black and white tuxedo cat. Uh, a tuxedo cat is a cat who's all black except for a white front like a tuxedo and little white gloves on his paws. And uh, this cat, Isaac, uh, shows up in a lot of postings on Facebook. And I have a black and white cat, and there's a certain attitude uh, these animals have, and uh, we uh, we share that. So uh, I know Jeff uh, musically as well as through car repair, and uh, uh, being also the uh, owner of a black and white cat. Jeff has been uh, out for a time. Uh, my understanding is he's um, he's had shoulder uh, medical issues, uh, maybe even surgery, uh, and uh, he's just back this week. And so we're glad that he's uh, uh, come back to us to. Uh, uh, participate and his first piece here that he's um, posted after several months is called uh, radiculopathy now it goes on for about 12 minutes we'll play an excerpt but uh, Jeff rather uh, he says I'm happy to say that I'm back for better or worse uh, here is some noise drone guitar with a touch of scrapes wizard for taste so uh, that's kind of mysterious let's hear what that sounds like
radiculopathy, and that's a mouthful, by Jeff Duke. Um, that's Jeff strikes a. He's doing all that with guitar, and he's, uh, you know, it's all he's using a lot of processing. He's got a bazillion pedals, and um, he he really brings to mind, uh, you know, Roger in a sense, Roger Sundstrom, who we featured last time, who also finds just different noise, different tone, different sounds out of the instrument without it being the instrument, and Jeff equally does that so well and uh that piece the graphic talking about you know this connection between graphics like we talked about chris's graphic of inside the jail with that recording well in jeff's case he posted what appeared to be a uh i guess it's a ditcom uh, uh or uh, uh like a cat scan of some of the uh, we believe it's shoulder uh related uh, yeah, that's recently. what I was thinking. Shoulder yeah. or joint of some kind, yeah. But it was really intense, and it's sort of, you know, again, music and pictures. It really uh, is connecting, and uh, it's, uh, I don't know, it was really, really his usual noise level in there. Yeah. Well, I thought that um, he, what he tried to do was to recreate, you know, he takes you right down to kind of a microscopic level. Um what if you are a piece of muscle or bone that's just about to get cut during surgery? And this sounds very graphic just talking about it, but it sounded like a sonic description of just that. Uh, and when you're looking at that x-ray and you hear this, it's almost like, you know, you can hear the surgeon. He's got some sort of motorized oh, something, yeah. and he's grinding and cutting away, you know. And you're right down there with the little uh, cells, you know. There, there's kind of a feeling of sawing and scraping. And uh, it occurred to me, it, it almost sounded like you could hear the screams coming oh, out of yeah. the cells as they're being, you know, uh, cut and rearranged uh, by the uh, the scalpel. So it was uh, really great imagery there on that level. Uh, and you don't think about what, what is it like to be inside your, your elbow or shoulder, but, uh, you know, when you're, when you're undergoing surgery. But Jeff has taken us there right, right down to a microscopic level. Um, I thought that about 10 minutes into this, uh, it suggested to me that the patient was kind of um, regaining consciousness. Hmm. There's a little blurriness and some pain, and then and then you, you kind of falls back asleep. <laughs> uh, and and earlier in the piece, and uh, around the middle, you know, it was kind of, it, it it became quiet and almost trance-like, as if well the the trauma is over and now it's resting in here. So you know, he kind of takes us through this whole procedure here and. Uh, Looking at that x-ray, that's all I could think about. You know, this must be what it must be like if you're uh, right down against the bone and the scalpel's headed your way. I thought it was an excellent, uh, you know, recreation of that. Oh, yeah. I, I, I mean, it was so, uh, <laughs> it's just like Chris's in that regard. It's so connecting. And, man, you talk about the screams and the tone. is like this is, a, you know, all Dr. Jekyll going on. But it's... Uh, it it really uh, it, it was so really he's been been away from the community for many months and it was so great to have him return it was like clearly yeah, a homecoming. Yeah. I've got two questions for Jeff if if we can somehow maybe get in touch with him. Is, is uh, radiculopathy a real word or did he make that up? Is that something <laughs> he heard a doctor say or is this is just a made up word? I, I'm I'm not sure. And secondly, uh, you know, are we we correct in in our assessment of his uh, his intentions here. You know, it's uh, I I really sa it sounded to me just like an operation, uh, as viewed from the perspective of the the muscle and joints undergoing that operation. Maybe I'm wrong, <laughs> or or maybe he'll admit that uh, it's been on his mind and you know this is kind of coming out uh, in his art. Uh, it it seems uh, it seems very convincing. So uh, it'd be interesting to hear what. Uh, what he thinks he was trying to communicate with this piece. I'd, it'd be really interesting to hear his uh, his perspective. Well, certainly. You know, uh, words on new music, uh, we're, we're in the early stages. This is about our, this is our fourth show. Um, we have done three of this kind of mini review shows, and we're trying to do one of these every, uh, it's almost becoming every week. Uh, it, uh, so, you know, we've kind of, got this going almost in a logging standpoint and then we uh, we have 
another part of this that's an interview series uh, where we do somebody in depth for around an hour uh, and we initially kicked off the channel with an interview with pianist Ben Smith so maybe Jeff will find his way to that uh, you know in, in coming times uh, well, maybe yeah. just post us a post us a comment or something to see if we're totally off uh, base here, or if we uh, we got some idea of what he was trying to communicate. Correct. <laughs> oh yeah, sure, sure. I know because there's a certain mystery there. There's mystery in both gentlemen's pieces. That's for sure. And our third one up for the night, uh, and our last feature of this show is a gentleman who lives over in England, Stephen Moyes, and um, he is. Also big on looping, and Paul's going to tell us a little bit about him, and then we'll listen to a piece of his. Right. Well, Steve is from Kent, England. I guess that's southeast England. Uh, Steve is a fully trained and experienced community music facilitator, and that means he delivers uh, high-quality music workshops for children and adults of all ages. Uh, these workshops promote uh, creative self-expression, and physical and psychological well-being, social inclusion, and fun. So I think he's got a, a kind of a um, practice going there where he'll go around and uh, give uh, clinics or, or uh, uh, be a community music facilitator. Uh, Steve plays a cello, electric guitar, and zaffoon. His musical uh, interests uh, are experimental uh, with extensive use of electronics, looping, and computer processing. Uh, he studied at Goldsmiths, I guess that uh, is a music school or a school of some kind in the UK. Um, Steve collaborates with a wide variety of musicians and artists in other media, including film, dance, drawing, painting, and the spoken word. And he's always keen to be involved in any new projects, collaborations, or performances. Uh, his <clears throat> latest album is called Gardening, and it's on the Linear Obsessional label. It's a collection of solo acoustic guitar improvisations. Uh, performed and recorded by Steve in the back garden of his home uh, during the spring of <clears throat> this year, which has been very well received, and uh, a lot of people have downloaded it and, and had a listen. Uh, he also, uh, Jim, collaborated with you on something called Growing Towards the Sun. I'm not sure when that was, but uh, he's also appeared uh, on Three Legs Duck Net Label uh, and uh, a couple of other places. Uh, his uh, website is www.stevemoyes.org.uk. That's S T E V E M O Y E S dot O R G dot UK. <laughs> and the piece uh, we're going to hear uh, now is uh, the one he posted this past week uh, called Peelings. And uh, here's the note that he uh, posted with it. He says, Good evening, all. I never seem to get here before Saturday. And I haven't even done any listening yet. Anyway, I'm looking forward to hearing all your doings. Here's a Zaffoon thing with some looping. So, you know, I didn't even I, know I what a Zaffoon <laughs> was until about a year ago. I may, and uh, maybe it's just as well. But uh, it's a very um, interesting sound. And uh, I guess we'll hear it now with some looping. <laughs> Thank you. 
And that was an excerpt from Steve Moy's uh, piece, Peelings, uh, which one thing I was really hearing in that, I'm uh, among several things a big fan, uh, it seems, uh, Bill Frizzell, uh, who's kind of a very kind of witty and, well, everybody knows who Bill Frizzell is. I don't need to talk about that. But he's uh, got a lot of wit and space, effective use of space always in his stuff. And I was I was thinking all through that of Bill Frizzell and how Steve, Steve, has done pieces similar to this before because he, he he really takes things like this in a looping fashion. I believe he's using the software Mobius, and he, uh, you know, it's just a great sense of painting in his tones. And uh, but in the, the 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 lines from the horn, which is the, the zaffoon, I think is almost like a. a a, a bagpipe chanter, I think, or something akin to that. I may be confusing it, but it's it's a almost re- maybe more like recorder like. Uh, but it's um, it, it's almost like hide and seek going on there. But uh, Bill Frizzell really came to mind to me. Uh, can you describe a zaffoon any better, Paul? I don't know. I I don't. Does it have a reed, or is I, it uh, uh, like a recorder without a reed? I. Th- I think it does have a read. This is where we're guessing. We should have Googled that. Uh, yeah, but, yeah. But uh, I, th- I think, and I, I, I'm just thinking that I should have done that. But I want to say it does have a read. I don't think it's like a double read, like a, like a bassoon type thing. But it's, right, it's it's kind of close to the clarinet in a little ways. Uh, so maybe mm-hmm. maybe it does have a single read. Yeah, I thought this piece had <laughs> very interesting, uh, good use of echo and processing. You know, he's really manipulated this uh, very well, and it, it heightens the tone of the Zaffoon. He's, he's organized his processing to uh, get a little more out of it than probably is there. Uh, I thought he managed to get some nice harmonies together with a looping, uh, and w- especially when the Zaffoons all sound together. Uh, and, and it was effectively mixed with all the uh, electronic elements as well. So it was uh, well put together. Uh, we didn't hear it in this uh, segment, but uh, in in part of this piece, it, it it is at times intense, and I thought almost klezmer-like uh, in its you know yeah. its kind of frenzy and and sound. Uh, in the calmer sections uh, that we had, something like we've just heard, it has almost a pastoral quality. It's like you're walking in a woods or a, a pasture or something, and you hear the various creatures you know sounding out or birds calling, uh, and so it has kind of a you know, an, uh, a a nature-like uh, quality uh, to my ear in in the calmer pieces. So um, it's an interesting uh, set of uh, of sounds, and uh, you know, uh, it's been uh, carefully put together and uh, and very effective. Uh, I, I totally agree on that. He's uh, he, he's he, he's he always says he's kind of simplistic about his looping, but I, I find the opposite. He seems like it's very dense and detailed. And uh, anyhow, it, it, it was. I thought it was really neat, and I kept thinking of Bill all through there. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, and we were talking about various things with Steve. Uh, we he and I collaborated through uh, some Ninjam sessions. Um, I mean, we've collaborated as part of the quintet I mentioned earlier to get Signal, but we also did a duo record, and I think that was about a year and a half ago. It's out on Bandcamp. And uh, uh, the other thing I was thinking of, though, uh, as opposed to tooting the the horn there, uh, he takes part in something that gets together called The Gathering. And I've talked to him a link about this. Um, it's, It's a group of musicians, dancers, poets, any kind of, like, art sort of person uh, is invited and, and they, they, they kind of announce a place it'll be and it, and it never has an official, uh, well I guess it has some kind of beginning and ending but they, they all meet and have this kind of mysterious reaction to each other's art and I think they meet a couple of times a month in London and then they have a big uh, annual get together and I noticed on his Facebook post that that's happening, I believe, in Wales um, at the the home of the woman who created it. Uh, but have you ever heard Steve talk about that? Uh, can't say I have. Uh, it sounds sounds like a good idea, uh, like an artistic grave, you know. It is something it's totally where, w- yeah, where you don't have to get permits or uh, a whole facility <laughs> rendered or something. You just kind of show up, and uh, but it sounds like a great uh, thing. It, you know, it would be very spontaneous and very. Uh, 
uh, improvisational, and it sounds like it'd be great fun to be part of that. I I, I totally uh, agree. I had a friend uh, from my work who was on an assignment and lived in England a few months, and he actually went to one of them and uh, told me a little bit about it, uh, if, if memory serves me right on that. And uh, But it, Steve has also told me a lot about that. I may be thinking some of it, but it, it just sounds like this kind of semi-unplanned state that people just really react to each other and, and very highly creative. Yeah. So anyhow, um, those are our three for this cast. Um, we're going to close out with just a little bit of kind of whatever we've been doing. Uh, and <clears throat> Paul attended a concert last evening in Los Angeles that sounded pretty cool, and he was going to shed a little bit about that. Yeah, well, I went to a, a concert of John Cage music uh, wow. uh, performed by Gloria Chang uh, in Pasadena at a, at a venue called uh, the Boston Court. And we heard two pieces. We heard um, uh, Water Music, uh, which is one of those uh, Cage pieces where he's got bird whistles and pictures of water <laughs> and sticks and, and, and all this performance uh, as, part of, as part of the piece and, and music as well. Uh, and uh, you know, Miss Chang, who's who's very dignified, uh, uh, who is, you know, uh, making these incredible, you know, bird whistles and and sounds. Uh, it was uh, very interesting to to see her. But you know, the minute her fingers hit the piano keys, you know, everything just changes. Uh, suddenly, you've gone from the mundane, everyday uh, chores that you're doing uh, to art. And I think this was Cage's purpose. Uh, uh, the the art is never far away from our everyday life, and our everyday life tends to bleed into our artistic uh, life. Uh, and I think uh, seeing that piece in person, it really brought that home to me. So I thought that was a that was very well done, uh, and difficult to do. Uh, the second piece on the program was sonatas and interludes, and this was a series of works, twenty of them all together, that Cage wrote uh, when he was working with Merce Cunningham, uh, the choreographer. And uh, this uh, is done with a prepared piano. So uh, we heard uh, this goes on for an hour when you do all 20 pieces in sequence. And, uh, you know, uh, if you've never heard a prepared piano, uh, hmm. it's, it's really, um, it, it just exceeds your expectations. You know, you're thinking, wow, it's going to sound like, uh, you know, like junk rattling around in there. But it doesn't. It, it, it gives a whole new texture to it. And, of course, this presents great, uh, challenges to the uh, performer, but uh, you know, Miss Chang's a, uh, the best there is at this, and she uh, did a, an excellent job. But the thing that uh, you know, I'm still kind of walking two feet in the air over uh, is after the end of the program, uh, Gloria Chang says, "Well, you know, if you want to come up on stage and see what's inside the piano, come on, you know, and you can help me take the parts out of it. It took three and a half hours to put them in. I need some help getting them out." Wow. <laughs> so they're about Eight or nine of us went up there and gathered around the the grand piano and helped her pull the bolts and the nuts and the wood screws out of the out of the wires, and uh, that was really cool. I, I got a picture of it. Uh, all of this has been described on Sequenza Twenty One, for those who want to read about it. Uh, and there's a picture there of the piano as it was prepared, uh, just before we uh, de-prepared it. So that was a lot of fun, and I uh, really enjoyed that. It was like going to Dodger Stadium, and then they ask you to to take third base into the dugout or something. You know, that was just really cool. wow. <laughs> so I, you, I enjoyed that quite a bit. Did you escape with anything? <laughs> no, tell. she, she uh, had them all uh, in uh, one of these uh, bolt and nuts uh, sorting things. Uh, she's got a whole kit she carries when she does this. Uh, and uh, I didn't. I didn't manage to get any souvenirs. And I suppose this destroys forever my objectivity about uh, about that performance. But uh, it was a lot of fun to, uh, you know, to see how that was done and to help undo it. That's really really amazing. I I, I I've watched some old performance videos of Cage, and it's just. Uh, I mean, uh, just what a time, what a wit, and what what a. So far ahead of his time, I, yeah, I really have come yeah, to appreciate yeah. him. You know, uh, all of what we heard today uh, stands on the shoulders of Cage. You know, all of these different sounds and these different um, uh, sonic experiences, uh, you know, really were pioneered by uh, by John Cage. I think uh, I think history will show that you know he kind of 
uh, showed the way for us at a time when it was very difficult to do so. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, certainly. I mean, uh, that's so, so true with everything that's flowed down the last 30 years, 40 years. And uh, there's a um, gentleman who's uh, Norbert Aldani, uh, who's a more senior member of Improv Friday, has uh, talked about a lot of... Um, I don't know what I what I think of as that time period. He was in academia and music academia in fifties and sixties, and, and talked about a lot of uh, kind of what we refer to as new music and experimental electronic music. And uh, I don't know. I, I I I it would have been a. Uh, I mean, I was about seven, I guess. So it would have been a neat time to be a fly on a wall. But you know, all those gentlemen, but particularly Cage set the stage for so much that's followed. Um, I, this, I didn't make this performance. I'll tie something in here, but I listened to a piece right before we on, went on that was really pretty neat, and it's by Michael Vincent Waller. And I just was, I saw a Facebook post he made in reference uh, to this piece, but it's a piece of his called, and I'm rough on the language here, but Allegoria della Primavera. And um, it's a, a duo string piece for violin and cello. Um, and it was a recording from a live performance that I was invited to at a venue that's home-based or apartment-based uh, in down in Chinatown called New Spectrum, uh, run by a guy named Glenn Cornett. And unfortunately, I couldn't make that night, but I was have been curious about some of Michael's string stuff. He's been kind of defining a name for himself in New York, doing a lot of drone and, and a tremendous amount of minimalist stuff. Um, and I've heard a couple other string pieces, and anyhow, I, I kind of just stumbled onto this as kind of like an after effect memory. But it's out on the SoundCloud page, the live recording. If you just go to SoundCloud and uh, look for Michael Vincent Waller, uh, and it's uh, it's it's probably his most recent posting. But it was really a cool inter interchange between a very rhythmic open and then kind of a release. And this went on for about a half an hour of a back and forth, and it was really some interesting counter lines and interesting contrast rhythms. And uh, uh, he's uh, definitely. Uh, uh, a voice that's on the rise in in the New York area. Yeah, what I'm, else? Uh, I'm I'm kind of rooting for Michael. I mean, you know, he's uh, out there trying to get some performances. He's he's had some success this summer, and uh, you know, you just root for a guy like that. He's you know he's working hard to to uh, get established, and uh, we hope that uh, he can be successful. And uh, you know, it's good that his music is is nice to listen to as well. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, certainly, and uh, I've heard him. I did make a live performance he did with James Ross. Um, in fact, we carried the stream. I was part of the production team that produced it about, gosh, it was right after I joined, and it was also um, kind of a somber note on it. It was when uh, musician, uh, electronic musician Richard Lanehart was still with us on the planet, um, and it was the first time I met Richard in person, but... Uh, Richard and I produced a webcast and um, from a, a venue out in Bushwick in Brooklyn, and Michael was on the show, and James, and an Australian uh, musician who's here in New York, resident here in New York, uh, Alex Carpenter. It was a very yeah. uh, certainly memorable night it. for many reasons now, particularly with Richard no longer with us or not not uh, in our human form, but uh, man, his spirit lives on. But uh, uh, anyhow, I, it's probably about time for us to bring this episode to a close. Uh, I do want to mention our channel, and we'd love you to subscribe to it. Uh, you can find it, uh, and I get, uh, you found it if you appear in this, uh, but I'll plug it in. We're here on YouTube at Words on New Music. And uh, we've been at this about a month, and uh, we're moving forward and doing uh, several different things, doing these review casts, and we'll have another interview cast pretty pretty soon. But thanks so much for checking us out, and uh, stay tuned for the next episode, and tell your friends, and do a subscribe, and I'll turn the camera over to Paul for a second to say so long, and we'll come back and close it out. Okay, so long. 
Paul, it's been great. It was a lot of fun, and uh, man, we're we're about three thousand miles apart. But it's uh, we uh, this is pretty neat to be uh, pretty neat times to be able to to see you and talk to you and uh, have this have this uh, this yeah, project uh, that we're putting together. As long as the bandwidth holds up, we're all right. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> All right, so before it chokes on us, we better close this one out. So uh, for Paul, I'm Jim, and listen, have a great one. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.